Let's take a look at some of the ways that newsrooms across the United States are using generative AI in their news gathering and back office processes and workflows. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the ongoing and robust debate and discussions that are happening across these newsrooms regarding the ethical and transparent use of these tools in their everyday news gathering operations. There are many people, much smarter and more learned than I am, who can speak to this in much more detail and nuance, and you can visit the link on your screen to learn more and read more about these ongoing debates. For our purposes, I want to focus on some of the more practical applications that I've seen in my capacity as Assistant Director at the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University. One of the most common applications that newsroom leaders have told me they're using these tools for are mostly centered around productivity and efficiency. Newsroom employees and journalists across the board are tired and they are burnt out. And these tools offer several opportunities and avenues for decreasing that cognitive workload on the individual journalist or newsroom employee, and in many cases, allow them to spend more time and energy focusing on serving the needs of their respective communities. I'm talking about things like content summarization and providing lists of key takeaways from lengthy documents, suggesting alternate headlines or possible social media posts to help promote their work and share it with their community. Some newsrooms are also using these tools to provide an editorial check on their own biases and gaps in their reporting, sourcing and source diversity shortcomings, and also just providing a general sense of why the public might care about the issues that are discussed and covered in their journalism. Oftentimes, journalists and editors can lose sight of the bigger picture, and while they have their head buried in their work and the value is self-evident to them, it's sometimes not as clear to members of the public why this is such an important issue. One thing that I've seen across the board is the desire and necessity to retain robust human oversight and input across all of these processes, no matter how much or how little these tools are involved in the process. One example is the Marshall Project, which has been using ChatGPT to turn complex bureaucratic text into simple summaries as part of the public service journalism that they produce. They use the tool to do textual analysis and help classify common topical features and themes in a particular body of text. They also give it a data dictionary and ask ChatGPT to group relevant text based on definitions found in that data dictionary. Having a human involved throughout the entire process is key for the Marshall Project. This human-machine hybrid approach opens up new reporting possibilities without compromising editorial integrity, and it helps already strapped newsrooms to overcome some of the resource constraints that they're facing while allowing reporters, designers, and product teams to prioritize their resource decisions by revealing what is a must-have now, what needs to be added later, and what shouldn't be greenlit at all. It's also important, as the Marshall Project points out, to speak with people who have the most experience around a particular issue area, because it's essential to make sure that when working with this new technology, the tools don't oversimplify complex social problems and issues. In particular, it's important to involve historically marginalized groups and the people that serve them in this design process and workflow in order to solicit feedback and get suggestions for different tools and information that you'll need to make sure your stories and products are responsive to real community needs. Another approach that newsrooms are taking involves newsletters. In particular, ARL Now has been testing the waters around some of this, as reported in the Neiman Journalism Lab. They've been using it to digest and condense information, create summaries and bullet points, help them simplify their research and their search processes, and even do basic tasks like text correction and simple copy editing. They've also used the tools to help categorize their articles into positive, neutral, and negative buckets for potential social media applications later on. They're even using AI to create two-minute audio news summaries as part of their newsletters, and to generate a thought of the day and a haiku of the day for their evening daily debrief website posts. Moving away from the public-facing stuff, you'll also find programmers and developers that are creating tools like Yeseo, which is a Slack integration by RJI fellow Ryan Restivo, and was created to help reduce the amount of time required to come up with relevant headlines, find the right keywords to use for search engine optimization, and provide correct information at the correct time to make sure that the journalist's work is seen and read by members of the public. 
And then there's my favorite application. I spend so much time reorganizing and reformatting text, applying different formatting styles to the text, such as Markdown or CSS and HTML. And so allowing these tools to work on certain sets of information rather than having them generate it from scratch helps to ensure that one, the amount of hallucinations that are generated is reduced because it's not having to come up with any new information. And two, it allows me to save time on these tedious tasks, which would normally take little chunks of my time throughout the day, which adds up. Finally, one of my favorite and probably one of the more ambitious applications that some newsrooms are talking about, but not many, is the idea of using these tools to scrape through your own newsroom archives to provide not only a better understanding of your work internally, but to allow members of the public to interact and ask questions about your reporting. For instance, if a news organization publishes a story, typically the only options a reader has is to read the article in its entirety, check the comments section, maybe check social media, or hopefully go through the rest of the publication's website and search for other articles with similar tags. But if newsrooms were able to fine-tune some of these models on their entire story archives, or even create specific embeddings from stories that have similar tags or are focused on a similar topic or issue, newsrooms would be able to allow members of the public to ask questions not just about that one story, but all of the information and reporting that has been gathered and published using these context embeddings to pull information from previous stories and incorporate them into the information and memory that's stored in the bot on their website. Of course, these tools are so painfully new that it's almost impossible to understand or predict where we'll be even six months from now. And in fact, by the time you watch this video, most of what I said may already be out of date. But one of the most important things that journalists and publishers and anyone who's interested in the intersection of media and technology needs to understand is that these tools are much more valuable and transformative if they are understood as a new way of interacting with the information and the data on your computer. And as the capabilities and accessibility of these tools continues to expand, we are very much likely to see direct natural language inputs translated into executable and material actions taken on behalf of the user. The ability to not only have conversations with these tools and allow them to spit back text to you, but then take actions on your behalf, change code, edit and revise content, generate user and customer profiles, create entire websites or programs, and other tasks like this will be an equally if not more fundamental revolutionary change in our relationship with our machines. I hope this was a useful overview, and if you have any questions, I urge you to reach out to me at the center at info at centerforcooperativemedia.org. I'm Joe Amditas. Thanks so much for watching.